the first thing that struck me when I was in the US was just how many Australians were over there. Uh, whether it be in San Francisco or New York or even Boston, um, there's Australians littered all over the United States. I've seen that in other uh, trade missions as well. Um, that begs a couple of questions for me is, you know, why have you left Australia to, to kick your business along? A lot of that has um, a, a lot to do with access to capital. So we've heard a lot about um, the, the, probably the immature nature of uh, venture capital uh, in Australia and we're seeing changes to that where we've got more and more funds coming online. Um, I think people are looking to tap into the strong uh, and high quality of innovation that exists here. I also think that um, we've seen a renewed focus on the commercialisation of research, uh, particularly out of universities. I think we've still got a way to go but the opportunity for universities to be uh, locations where innovation and commerce can come together and spinning businesses out of universities is quite common in places like the United States and Europe, particularly the US. So I think we can do a little bit more in that regard. But I'm, I'm always happy to see Australians venturing overseas. We've always been a country that's taken our, our great ideas offshore and shared them with the world. I don't think that should change. It'd just be good if we could commercialise a few more of them at home. We're already doing that uh, here in New South Wales particularly. You, you've got organisations like Dropbox, Qualtrics, uh, Facebook, uh, SurveyMonkey. Um, so strong IT firms are already um, uh, establishing here in New South Wales and particularly Sydney. I think the strength of the strong financial services sector out of this city uh, is a real attractor for a number of businesses that are looking to come here. I think for European and US businesses, Sydney represents a fantastic safe landing zone in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I, I see an increasing level of talent, so the, the talent pool and the quality of talent um, is getting stronger in this market. I think it's still the strongest market of any of the capital cities in Australia and then you get to blend that with a, a wonderful lifestyle. I also think there's a unique business model available to uh, particularly IT firms to have back of house uh, activities or uh, engineers based in somewhere like Sydney and more customer focused orientated uh, members of your staff based in San Francisco or London or New York. So um, in a global world we should be looking to work with businesses around how they structure their business uh, and we've also got some fantastic uh, case studies of organisations that have gone overseas. Atlassian is a, obviously one that everyone's aware of but there's plenty of other uh, organisations that are churning away that have the capacity uh, to be Australia's next unicorn. RMB is now one of the most traded currencies in the world. Um, so having Sydney as an RMB clearinghouse or trading house, I think makes uh, this location easier to do business in, particularly when you're uh, attacking some of those really strong growth markets like the Chinese market, particularly when it comes to RMB. The movement of currency and the trading in currency de-risks investment for businesses. Uh, and so we want to encourage more people to be able to access that. Uh, but I'm a strong believer in collaboration being almost the new form of competition. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but uh, what, we, what we're seeing across the globe now is someone with 80% of the idea, rather than battling it out and wasting large amounts of capital finding the final 20%, they just find the other partner who has that, who has that 20%. They come together and, and largely that's where businesses are, are being generated from. I think that can happen across cities. So the idea of innovation happening in Shanghai and Sydney or Singapore and Sydney is really quite attractive to me. So whether it's a, uh, you know, a Data 61 working with someone like Stone and Chalk and two businesses in those two centres uh, working to, on, a, on a solution that can be proliferated across the Asia-Pac region I think is where the future lies. I think it's very much in its infancy still. I think it's provided a very, very strong brand for us to talk about the strength of fintech overseas and the role government can play. I don't think government provides all the answers by any stretch of the imagination, but the fact that the New South Wales government has been so prepared to financially invest in something like Stone and Chalk is a very positive step in the right direction. Uh, but what I think it's also allowed us to do is bring together that fintech community. Um, we talk a lot about the strength of the ecosystem across startups more generally in Sydney, but it's very strong in the financial services. Uh, and the capacity to partner with large financial institutions as well, I think provides something that's quite unique here. Um, 
I see the, the big four banks and the large presence of international banks reaching quite deep into the startup ecosystem to find new payment methods, uh, how they can identify new applications to be used across their businesses. I think that we've got quite an innovative large scale sector here and that'll create new opportunities for fintech businesses and Stone and Chalk becomes a fantastic accelerator and incubator for them. I actually think that's both sides of the market responding. I think the, you know, the larger banking institutions that have been established for a long period of time are natural innovators in their own right. They still wouldn't be operating unless they, unless they were. So they can sense changes to consumer behaviour, the way people interact with financial institutions, the way commerce takes place, particularly the, the payments system at its very basic level. And so they want to be able to create better customer experiences. They recognise that larger cumbersome institutions may not have the drive or the capacity to innovate as quickly as what the customer wants. So what you're seeing now is that is that collaboration model. So my sense is that that trend will continue uh, for the foreseeable future and I think that's where we can play a really strong role here in New South Wales. Generally, the New South Wales government has a very pro-business structure and is, has very pro-business regulations. Um, we're also looking at ways to incentivise people who want to come to New South Wales. So businesses, not necessarily at that startup phase, but particularly uh, businesses that are, are looking to move into New South Wales, perhaps as a, as a launching pad for the Asia-Pac region. We've got things like payroll tax incentives that we use uh, quite aggressively to attract business. Uh, we also work with the needs of those businesses as well, plugging them into the city Sydney ecosystem, which I think has been more valuable than any direct incentive that the state government can provide. Um, I, I think we will continue to work quite closely uh, with the federal government where most of the uh, regulatory framework still exists. I'm very um, impressed with the work that's been done by the Commonwealth government around its innovation statement, um, its desire to want to incentivise and support venture capital and also uh, make it easier for people to move in and out of the country because uh, access to talent is going to be so much much more uh, important when it comes to driving and growing this sector. So we'll continue to, to support the federal government in their initiatives and where we've got levers to control, we'll almost always be pulling them in favour of small business. We wouldn't control too many taxes where we could create a, a tax holiday um, in, in that sense, uh, but I can understand why you would want to be creating uh, a, a tax arrangement that largely pushes as much cash flow as possible into the growth of the business. Um, that's probably not too dissimilar from any other small business. So uh, I think you'll see more work by the Commonwealth, particularly around write-offs on investments and in infrastructure, um, uh, particularly capital investments into businesses, how they might be able to write those, uh, write those uh, investments off faster um, and, and push more cash flow into businesses. The first thing that really struck me is lots of people had heard about it. So I think I was expecting to have to go over there and do a bit of a sales pitch, tell people what was happening, talk about the VC environment, talk about a stone and chalk, talk about the university sector, the close collaboration with, with banks. But really when I got there, people already knew about a lot of those sort of key messages. What they wanted to learn a little bit more about was how that sector was going to grow, um, how Sydney could be used as a launching pad into the Asia Pacific region, and, and how we could leverage out of um, some of the investment that was taking place in larger scale institutions. So we spoke a little bit earlier about collaboration with larger banks, not just the kind of big Australian banks, but there's now over 60 international banks located in Sydney. People were very interested in that in the fintech space. Um, also very large trading community, so lots of uh, people engaged in stock market trading here. Uh, so people were looking at, um, at Sydney as a location where they could get into, uh, into that market. And, and I, th I thought the other thing that was, that was quite interesting to come out of that was that people said that if they could get access to better VC funds or more VC funds, they'd be more inclined um, to be engaged in, in Sydney. So I think there's a, that's a challenge for both the Commonwealth and the state government around how we can do things to incentivise and attract uh, VC funds into our startup ecosystems.
The significant investor visa arrangements are very interesting. I think states are still working through how they uh, actually leverage out of that more effectively. Um, we're, we're really grappling with how do we take a person who wants to invest in a relatively low risk investment like property and move them into a you know, what we recognise as a higher risk investment. So is there a role for government to play there, I think is, is one that we've got, to, we've got to grapple with internally. I don't have a perfect answer for you on that right now, um, but it's definitely something that's occupying the minds of my trade and investment team. Um, we also want to work more effectively with uh, other parts of government and also um, intermediaries as well. So people who are looking to get uh, some of the funds that they've got available, the large amounts of capital that are floating around the world into um, lower risk uh, in VC environments or VC funds um, is something that we've, we've got to start to structure some of those funds. Also, I think what's important is that we work with our own superannuation funds. We're talking multiple trillions of dollars are under management here in Australia, and they're all in relatively low risk investments, whether they be equities or uh, property diversified trusts. Um, being able to just shift the needle there, a very small amount, would open up a large amount of capital. And I think if we had our own domestic pool of capital, that could be matched with international capital. My sense is people don't necessarily want to go it alone in the investment. Uh, so if they can be in a more stable in, uh, fund environment, then you're going to get better results. Yeah, well, the needle doesn't have to shift far. You're talking about uh, $3 trillion of funds under management in Australian superannuation funds. Um, we don't have a sovereign wealth fund in Australia, but what we do have is the largest pool of private superannuation, uh, one of the largest pools of super, private superannuation anywhere in the world. Right now, our regulatory environment probably makes it difficult based on the need for liquidity. Um, so I think that's probably the next big discussion um, around how we might be able to make the risk environment uh, a little bit more suitable for people wanting to put uh, some of their money into, into VC. It doesn't have to be entirely angel investor, so to speak. Um, but is there a role for government to play a de-risking role? I think that's a worthwhile conversation.